Hey everybody, this is Peter Hawley, and welcome to my podcast, Teaching in the Arts. Thanks for coming back. Uh, today, my guest is Brad Giori. Brad is, uh, we're having a Skype session internationally. He's uh, at uh, uh, Bournemouth, England, where he teaches. He taught with me here uh, in Chicago, and before that, he was at Arizona State University. Uh, but before he became a teacher for 20 years, he worked in Hollywood. He was the head writer for Talk Soup for 10 years. He's been nominated for five Emmy Awards. And we have a really great conversation. And, and we talk about a bunch of things, including just sort of innovation and in teaching and getting students out of the classroom and uh, into the world. And his current work, uh, really based on the work of Mary Shelley, because uh, he teaches right down the street from where she's buried. And he is doing a really interesting uh, piece on her life and it's interactive and it's going to be on your phone come October, but you have to go to Bournemouth, England for that. Before, but before we get to Brad, uh, the lesson of the day. So because Brad is in England, it got me thinking about, about international students and about, about students traveling. And, and um, I've had a whole bunch of international students. Uh, I currently have a couple from, from the Ukraine and from China. And, uh, but the ones I think about are, um, actually two cousins from South Korea, and this is probably 20 years ago, late 90s, right around 2000, but, but 20 years ago, really. And uh, Hyup Kim and his cousin Yoon, and um, they were two of the most creative students I've ever had. And I, I mean, I you know love all of my students equally, but these two were really exceptional people. So I had Hyup first, and it was a sort of an intermediate production class. And to be very honest, his English wasn't all that great. And he came in, and he made a really fine first project, and he was really, he's artful. There was just no other way to put it. And for his final film, he told me what he wanted to do. And one of the things he wanted to do was create a, a set, a bathroom set, and he uh, wanted to sort of echo the the painting Death of Marat. And uh, he said he wanted to have the walls of the set breathe and move in and out. And I went, yeah, sure. Uh, like, you can really do that. I didn't say that to him. I said, oh, that's very interesting. Yep. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, let me know how I can help. And he somehow um, put muslin on, on frames and had people on the outside of it just push on it lightly. And, and he does this dolly shot down the hall and into the bathroom. And sure enough, the walls of this bathroom were breathing. And the entire class, when they saw it, gasped. Like, we didn't think he could do it. And it was brilliant and beautiful and cinematic and kind of, you couldn't really explain what it was, but he was just absolutely amazing. So a semester later, uh, his cousin, Yoon, uh, comes to my class and asked to get in and said, uh, look, my cousin is Hyup. She doesn't speak English all that well either. And she was more impressive than he was. Uh, in that class, it was again an intermediate class. She made a, uh, a, a her first film and then she made her second film. And at the end of the semester, we voted on, on all the films in the class and her films were first and second best. She was that much more talented than anyone else. And it was because she is a pure artist. She is actually a professor at a university in South Korea now and uh, is an artist, has art exhibitions. It's not so much a filmmaker, is really just a, an artist and went on to grad school. And, and we still have relationships with, with each of them. I haven't seen Yoon in years, but uh, Hyup invited me to his wedding 10 years ago or so. And I was one of two or three non-Koreans in, in the room. And it's really amazing. Uh, the bride and the groom made videos that they played in the church of each other and for each other. And then at the reception, and thank God I was sitting next to someone who, who spoke enough English to tell me what was going on. It was effectively a game show. And, 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 and it, was, it was a game show. There were, there were contests and things like that. I've never seen anything like it, but it was really, really great. And so because Brad's here, I'm thinking about uh, the international experience. And, and I have to give a shout out to Hyup and Yoon, uh, two of my all-time favorite international students. Uh, and I hope I get more. So um, my guest, as I said, is Brad Giori. Brad has just got this really interesting um, career. He is now a senior lecturer in digital storytelling at Bournemouth University in the UK. He has a PhD in rhetoric and composition from Arizona State University. And he's taught both media theory and production at ASU and with me at Tribeca in downtown Chicago. And now he is over there. As I said, he was uh, head writer for Talk Soup for 10 years and uh, worked in LA for 20 years before he became a teacher. And here's our conversation now.
Mr. Brad Giori, how are you? Good. How you doing, Peter? I'm good, thanks. And, and how are things in, in Bournemouth, England? What's it, what's it like there? Uh, what's it like just being an expat, or you're not really an expat? What are you living there and, and teaching there? What's what's it like? Well, it's the it's supposed to be sort of the sunny beach community of England, but um, it's a little you know it's different than Los Angeles, I have to say. <laughs> it's, it's it's a little windier beach, and uh, but it's a it's a fun place to work. Um, and it's an interesting community. It seems to be sort of half pensioners and half uh, university students. What, what are the students like? I mean, you you tell me, you told me that so the the to get a well, I guess the equivalent of a bachelor's degree, it's a three year program, right? And what are the, what are they like? What what are, yeah, why do they go to school there? What are, what are they? Where are their backgrounds like? Well, I'm teaching on the journalism course, but I also do a lot of stuff with the with the media production students. Um, it's one of the uh, more innovative programs around. The, the, the students often, um, that the ones that don't wind up going uh, to school in London, uh, like uh, our son Jack actually went to Ravensbourne in London, um, but a lot of students sort of decide between that and Bournemouth. There's, there's some of the more sort of practically uh, oriented uh, uh, schools. It's a post-92 university. What's that mean? Which... Um, well, they, they used to be vocational schools, ah. and then they were sort of changed into uh, regular proper universities and with more of a research mission. And so since then, Bournemouth has had this big transition that it's gone through and it's grown and, and become much bigger. But I think students still come to it looking to actually make things and do things. Hmm. What, what um, you know, how, how big is it? How big are your classes? I mean, what's the overall... Enrollment, do you pro- approximately? Yeah. I teach, uh, tend to teach seminar groups of about 20 students mm-hmm. per, and then often we'll do team based things. We'll break them into groups of four to five students per group. So you have about four groups within your seminar group. Um, in terms of our, the, on the journalism course, uh, for each year we have, let's say, roughly 100 students. Wow. Uh, across three years. So th- I guess that'd be roughly 300. And then we're part of a school called Jack, which is journalism, English, and communication. Uh, English is a little bit smaller. Communication is a little bit larger, but they all sort of, you know, probably equal out to be that. And then that's, it's part of the media faculty sort of in this larger thing. So there's media production, there's animation, there's these the uh, sort of other faculties that are part of that. And then, of course, we're part of this larger university that has all kinds of things from business schools to anthropology, mm-hmm. um, you know, you name it. I, um, I think those of us here in the States, when we think of of uh, British universities, we think of Oxford and Cambridge, and then because of the WHO live at Leeds, you know, <laughs> Leeds <laughs> University, <laughs> and, and a few others, of course. But, but in terms of... Of sort of re- overall rank of of uh, where where does Bournemouth fit into the the s- system there? Um, well, it's not a Russell Group University like Oxford or Cambridge. So those are the more the old school mm-hmm. traditional universities. Um, I think its its ranking is very high though for one of the new universities, especially in terms of media and journalism in particular. I think we're we're sort of a standout that uh, that a lot of people like aspire to and what do those students go on to do are they, are well, they getting jobs and stuff or are they have any yes. any famous grads um hmm. uh i'm trying hey, to i've taught i've taught for 22 years i don't have any famous grads so it's not yeah. <laughs> the end of the world but but i mean well, you know i will say you know uh i don't know if famous would be the word but we we definitely get people that are you know we just had uh like uh, one of our grads from last year, Roshan Crooks, just got a job at the BBC. Um, we have a recent grad named Joe Nassesserin, who got a job at Associated Press. Um, we've had people work at, at Sky News, um, just all, all sorts of uh, placements. And then there's also the, our, our local paper, the Bournemouth Echo, which uh, Bill Bryson used to write wow. for back in the day. Wow, cool. That, yeah. So, so l- let's uh, l- let's talk about how you got there. Okay, <laughs> not not the immediate, sure. you know, from Chicago to, to to England, but but back where you started. Where are you from? I mean, I I know a little bit of this story, but where you know, what's your background? 
Well, I grew up in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and um, I was uh, one of those kids that would make home movies and and um, uh, was always doing different types of creative things. It a parody of the school newspaper when I was in high school, and a teacher sort of tapped me uh, to do a TV show. That was my first TV production cool. when I was in high school for the local Channel 10, and it was a parody of high school life. And I played uh, Mr. High School, the epitome of high school life, which was meant to be <laughs> sort of ironic. Um, but uh, so that gave me a little taste of that type of thing. And then um, eventually moved to Los Angeles and started working as a writer producer, not right away, but uh, started doing freelance work at a startup company called Movie Time there, actually completely volunteering to begin with, um, did a spec script for them. They liked it. And then I got hired on as a writer. Wow. And then uh, sort of off and running and then worked at different places uh, through my production career. Um, movie Time became E. Ah. Uh, and I continued as a writer producer with them. I uh, was a head writer of a show called Talk Soup for sure. 10 years. With Greg Kinnear. With Greg Kinnear and then John Henson and then Aisha Tyler. Um, and uh, that show won an Emmy and I got a bunch of nominations while I was there, which was exciting. And then uh, towards the end as my production career was winding down, I was bouncing around and, and experiencing what a lot of people do in the business, which is you work on a show and it's, it do, get, doesn't get picked up or you work on a pilot and it doesn't get greenlit. So, but during that time, it was an interesting experience because I got to work for MTV and VH1, um, did a lot of freelance stuff for FX. So huh. that was my production career. And then uh, I started wanting to sort of see if I could find a little more steady work, I uh, started thinking about going back to school, getting the doctorate, and pursuing a, a career in higher education. Well, let, let's, and, let's slow down for yeah. just one second. So, so sure. uh, you're back in high school, so you, you did this TV thing. Do you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have an older brother and a younger sister. Are they in, are they in the arts at all? Um, no, I think my brother's done marketing, and he's, he does <laughs> a lot of creative stuff with that. I mean, it, I, I think that's it's in the realm, yeah. but... But uh, not working in production. Yeah, and 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 your parents were supportive of, of you going down this path. Oh yeah, they were always very supportive. Uh, my my mother is the type that would you know if I even mentioned that I was interested in doing a drawing or something, she would just say, "Let's get in the car and you know take me to the art supply store and nice. get me whatever I needed." Very supportive. To this day, she has my drawings up around in their house. And nice. Yeah, Even I, ones that I'm kind of embarrassed by. I'm like, oh, you sure you want that up? <laughs> well, I mean, like, yes. you know, you you are you are a talented guy. I mean, you, you draw. I've I've seen you play guitar. You sing. I mean, it's it's you know, it's not just uh, writing. And and uh, I know you're very interested in new media and all sorts of things like that. So so I'm glad your parents were so supportive. Where did you go to undergraduate school? Uh, undergrad at ASU. Oh, okay. And that's funny because that's where I went back as a returning student years later, which is surreal. Did, did you want to, you know, so you said you went to LA and then, and we'll get, we'll get to grad school in a moment. Uh, it, when you said you went to LA and, and you worked first as a, as a intern or, or volunteer and you wrote the spec script, what, what were your yeah. goals when you went to LA? What, what did you aspire to? Well, you know, before that, you mentioned playing guitar. I'd been in a band, and I used to try and get those guys, say, we'll go to Los Angeles, we're going to hit the big time, we'll be a rock band out here. Um, and I could never get them motivated to do it. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, Chris, who's who's uh, we're, we're still together, wow. we have a couple of kids, but we used to vacation in Los Angeles, and we'd do these real quick vacations because we were both working. Uh, full time, but occasionally we'd get a weekend off and we would dart out to LA for a couple of days. Sometimes we'd sleep in our car the first night we got there to save money <laughs> wow. for the hotel. But one time when we were out, uh, she brought along uh, a change of sort of like nicer business clothes, looked in the want ads, and, and I have to give her credit for really driving it. She's like, you know, there's a job that I could apply for. And so she went and applied for this job down in Orange County. We were in Santa Monica, so we had, we wound up blowing that vacation, just chasing after this job, and then that started. <laughs> that went well, and it was like, well, now we have to find an apartment. So we rushed around and found a, an apartment, and then it was time to go home. And then we didn't hear forever, and we thought, well, we blew that vacation just chasing after this stuff. But after a month, she got the job. The apartment was still available, and it was like, all right, let's do this. Wow. 
so then we went out to we moved and at that point that you know that's as much thought as i'd put into what i was going to do except i just wanted to be in in los angeles uh, I did have a friend who was working at this startup called Movie Time, and uh, I got a job just to, to make pay the bills working at the Broadway, selling like men's uh, <laughs> furnishings, which is like underwear and, and socks and, and things like that. But in the meantime, this guy had moved out there and was working at this startup, and he said, well, what do you want to do? And I have to give him some credit. His name's Todd Daly. He works at ESPN now. Uh, he said – you know, if you, you say you're a writer, well, we have writers. Why don't you come in and apply for a job? And I said, well, you make it sound really easy. <laughs> yeah. I, I said, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I came in and I applied and the guy said, well, we no, we uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate this stuff, but we don't have any jobs. So then Todd said, well, how'd it go? And I said, well, it seemed like we had a nice rapport, but he said, we don't have any jobs. And he said, well, are you just going to take that for an answer? <laughs> And I said, well, I, I, what other option do I have? And he said, well, come in and start working on on, on, day, on your days off and hang out and let people know who you are and we'll see we'll see what happens. So that's what I did and I came in. So I, there was a month where I didn't have a day off because I was working five days a week at the Broadway and then on my two days off, I would go work this job. Wow. And I, you know, at first it was just like I was working teleprompter. You know, that's, everyone starts with teleprompter because it's a no brainer. Yeah. And uh, but I told everyone I could. I was like, you know what? I, 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 I write. I'd like to write if there's ever an opportunity. So I found out uh, after the month I was starting to get a little burnt out with no day off. But they the, the guy who hired the writers said, we actually are looking for a writer. Um, would you do this spec script? So uh, and, you know, a little bit back from that, while I was working at the Broadway, as an aspiring writer, I used to, every time I had a break or a lunch or whatever, I was working in a notebook. I was always writing. So that's sort of that preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. My chops were pretty good by then. So uh, I poured everything I had into the script and they liked it and I got hired. And, uh, but the guy who hired me got fired before I started. Oh. So the day I started, I came in there and the people who had sort of been behind it were a couple of the writers <laughs> who were in there because <laughs> they were not, they were kind of, uh, disgruntled and, and, uh, at, at odds with this person. So when I first came in, I said, well, I'm the new writer that Neil hired. And it was like, well, he's gone. And I was like, okay, well, do, do you have any writing for me to do? And, no, we don't. <laughs> you can go help them file things in the library. So I had this really weird sort of difficult. So my first day on my writing job, I was in the library filing press kits and stuff. Wow. And I realized I was like, I'm not going to be able to hold on to this job. If I, if I come back tomorrow and I'm still doing this and I do this for the rest of the week, they're going to just get rid of me. Yeah. Cause this isn't what I was hired to do. So the next day when I came in, I walked into this little dinky writer's room and I, I said to him, um, and Oh, they gave it, they said, you can't stay in here. There's not enough room. So your desk is out. On the in the sort of the waiting area. I mean, it was it was harsh. It was not the welcome committee. You know? I, I, that, that's not how they did it in the Dick Van Dyke show. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. it's hilarious <laughs> that you said that because this is exactly what I invoked the Dick Van Dyke show. <laughs> I, that's hilarious that you said that because this is what I said to them. I totally owned that this, that I was a complete newbie, and I said, "Okay, I'll admit I've never been a writer before, but I have watched the Dick Van Dyke show." <laughs> And one thing I know is all those writers were in the same room together. And I said, I'll, I could sit at the edge of a table here, one edge of one of your desks. I don't care what it is, but this is I'm a writer. And so this is where I belong. And they didn't have an answer for it. And, and it was funny. There were three of them in there. And one of the guys was to his credit is a big boy meddling. It's all big Texan. He's like, well, you can sit on the edge of my desk and here I got some stuff you can work on. And he gave me some stuff to do. And the other two kind of quieted down, and from then on, I was a writer. That is great, you know, Brad. That's a, that's a wonderful story, start to finish, because you know we've heard it on the on this podcast a bunch of times. Your buddy Bill Bacon said it on the very first episode. He worked for free for forty five days just to get in. You know, yeah. he he. You know, you worked for free. You you got in there. You worked another job so you could get in. You always kept writing. You always kept moving forward, and and. 
I've said here before, you know, the, the writer Kenneth Lonergan, I mean, we were with some students oh, at wow. Tribeca and, and Kenneth said, you know, he doesn't know anyone who hasn't kept at it for 10 years that doesn't have a job in the industry. And, and that's the key thing is you've got to keep at it, you know, and you've got to, you've got to force your way into that, into that room and into that party. And, and they're not going to come looking for you. They're not going through the phone book back then and saying, Hey, to get down to the G's for Jory, you know, and, and we're going to call you up for a job. <laughs> That's that's a really great job. So so you did that for how how long did, were you there at E and other jobs? I know you were at v, VH1 or some other places. How long did you do that whole Hollywood writing thing? Twenty years. Twenty years. What, what were some of the highlights? I mean, you mentioned Emmy nominations and stuff, but any any highlights? There are stories that that were like, yeah, this was really why I kind of got into this job. Um, well, the one I always think of is when we had uh, we had heard that when I was working on Talk Soup. Somebody said that they, they had a friend who was like, I don't know, they're a hairdresser. I don't forget what the deal was, but they somebody knew Dustin Hoffman's son. And they said, Dustin Hoffman's son is a huge fan of your show. He was just going on about how much he loves it. And then we sort of said, wouldn't it be great if we could get Dustin Hoffman to appear on our show? And one of the writers, uh, Laura Kierling, sort of jokingly said, well, we'd have to do a hunger strike to do that. <laughs> And uh, the host, uh, John Henson at the time, was like, you know, maybe we could. And then we started brainstorming about it and said, well, what would it entail to do this? And so we actually put on a hunger strike. <laughs> we came on. He said that I've heard that Dustin Hoffman's a fan of the show. I'm not going to eat until Dustin Hoffman appears on the show. And we we committed to this thing really hard. And. So it, the problem was we had no exit strategy. If he, <laughs> if he didn't want to do it, starvation. <laughs> it, that was it. It was like do or die. So as it as it wore on, we kept committing to it and pushing it further. So after all, he was doing the show from a hospital bed. He had an IV. <laughs> you know, we had we were trying to make him look as pathetic as possible. And we, I was going into a meeting to where we were going to try and figure out. It was two weeks into it. Like, how do we get out of this tight corner that we're in? And as I was in the meeting, somebody came in and said, we got him. He's going to come in and do the show. <laughs> and so we didn't have to try and figure out how to get out of it. And so he actually came in and they did this improv thing. He got John Lovitz to come in with wow. him. He played his lawyer. And we did this whole, we, you know, we had written this script uh, and that all got thrown out the window because uh, he didn't want to retell a prompter. And we, so we just beat it out and did it as a, an improv. And it, it was like a six and a half minute little deal. You can find it online. It's still up there. If you type in uh, Dustin Hoffman in my last name, it'll, it'll pop look up. It up. It's yeah. kind of fun to see. Huh. So, so that, that's a great story. And, but, but you did this for 20 years and then you made a, a right turn to go back to Arizona and go to grad school. Yeah. What, what, what was the thinking there? Well, you know how I was saying that towards the end of the career, uh, the production career, I had nine jobs in in four years, you know, just bouncing around. And each one of those took as much effort to apply for as a job you might have for 10 years. I mean, it's 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 highly competitive and challenging. And they were a lot of more jobs that I actually liked. But like I said, it would be the second season of a show on VH1 that just didn't get renewed or, or a you know, uh, you know, lots of things like that, like startups or pilots that just didn't get get go any further than that. So and then freelance stuff. So I it, that was just an, uh, it produced a lot of anxiety with sure. with kids, a mortgage, and all these other things. So uh, my wife and I talked about it, and uh, I re- I remember uh, just taking a long walk one day and just thinking like, is you know what would it be like if is would there be you know I got to the point I think where I was shaving years off of my resume to make it look like I had less experience than I did. <laughs> Which <laughs> seems surreal, you know. Like I'm less qualified. Trust me, yeah. hire me. Um, and I thought, would you know, wouldn't it be nice to go someplace where my experience was valued and people would say, "Wow, 20 years, that's awesome." Wow. Um, so I, that's kind of how I started sure. rethinking. So, so, it. so then, why you know, why ASU grad school and, and that program? I mean, you weren't, you know, going for an MFA, if I recall. Right. And I know yeah. you got your Ph.D. So what, what was why that program and what what did you really want to study and, and, and why that? Well, my my undergrad was English, English literature. And as a writer, I thought, well, you know, I could still stay within English. And it 
that the ASU thing made sense for a couple of reasons. One is my wife was able to get a work. Well, if we, we couldn't have stayed in California, it would have been too expensive because I was going to have to scale back. I was still doing some freelance writing, um, but I wasn't going to be bringing in as much money. And we had to go through several years where I was going to get back. And, and, and so we, we started thinking it through and her work had a position in Phoenix, Arizona. Ah. Phoenix, Phoenix is my hometown. My parents lived there. So we had a support system. And, um, so I started looking into it at ASU, uh, at the time they didn't have a, uh, film and media school, uh, but they did have, uh, 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 the degrees, PhDs that you could get in English. So I could continue with my degree and the, they had one in rhetoric and composition. I didn't even know what rhetoric was at the time, <laughs> but I started looking into it and I said, well, this kind of dovetails with media because it's the study of the art of persuasion. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you could write about the media if, if, if you, if you has this as a degree. So anyways, that's what I pursued. And in my first semester there, they started a, a, a film and media uh, school uh, both the film and media production and film and media studies it, that is, same semester. Isn't the Walter Cronkite journalism school out there? Is it? Yes. Yeah. It's, That's not, so you weren't part of that though. But I wasn't part of that. Hmm. That, they, that their campus is actually in the downtown ah, area in ah. Phoenix. And we were on the Tim P campus. Ah. And they also have a communications school that's more of a studies sort of thing that's on the Tim P campus. Ah. Um, but while I was there that semester, they'd started film and media studies and, uh, Somebody mentioned it to me. I didn't even know about it because it was so new. But I immediately went up there and said, hey, you know, here's my background. Uh, if you guys are looking for people to help out. And they were intrigued and uh, they brought me on as a as a teaching assistant for just one semester and then immediately had me start teaching classes while I was still in grad school. Nice. And that's how I got my experience. What? What? Uh, so, what did you think you were going to do? You were going to go to grad school. You were going to go back to grad school, and and or you go back to school and go to grad school and get your degree. Then, what did you think? Did you think, oh, professor, you know, Giori? What? Where, I assume, yeah. you know. Yeah, the plan was to teach um, and and do research. Um, it was, but it was a leap of faith because I remember somebody at one point said, "What if you don't like teaching? Yeah. <laughs> or, or what if they don't like you? You know, or what if, if they don't like you? Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. and and what did you say to that when they someone said, "What if you don't like teaching?" Uh, I, I, I didn't really have an answer for it because <laughs> I was so deep in. I was like, I just, I hope I do. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, did you did you know those first classes when you were in still teach when you were still in grad school and you were teaching? Did you did you like it? Did you enjoy it? Uh, did did you feel something? Uh, because there is a performative aspect to teaching, and you are a performer. You know, I mean, you you you're not shy. Um, you know, do do you did you feel something right away? I, well, mostly nervous. That was the first thing. I was very nervous, though. And I remember the first class I taught. I don't think I stood up. I I was I sat on the table in uh -huh. front of the classroom the, the, the whole semester. And then my goal for my next class is like, okay, I'm going to get stand up away from that and walk around because it was you know it's it's, it's you have yeah. to learn how to do this of stuff course. and be a little more relaxed. Um, but I did I did like it right away. Okay. And and. But, you know, we were – because I was – the odd thing is with my background and you know, when we worked together at Tribeca, I was doing more practical stuff. But at, at ASU, I was doing more studies things because it was in the same building as the English uh, school. The, the, these, this was – the people there were mostly PhDs. They didn't come from uh, industry. They – they weren't people that made things. They were uh, analytical. They they wrote articles about things, mm -hmm. and, and and which was interesting. It was a sure. new way of, of thinking about the media for me. It was really helpful. Uh, but the t type of classes I were, was teaching were things like, uh, you know, television and and, and cultural studies, um, looking at at race, class, and gender through the lens of you know uh, uh, through things like film and television and and new media. I love those so was, classes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it was fun to teach them, but it was very, um, it was much more lecture based. Uh -huh. And, uh, and then at the same time I, they were having me teach screenwriting classes. So it would be an interesting thing. Like I would teach like that television and cultural studies class and then walk across campus. And then I'm teaching a screenwriting class. And it was like in that little 15 minute walk, it's like I had to change my <laughs> Yeah. whole personality. It's like, okay, now I'm a different, now we're going to sit around a table and it's going to be much more collaborative. Yep. You know, it's a very different thing. 
Yeah, yeah so, I, I'm doing that right now, actually. I'm, I'm teaching a new media class, and then I have back-to-back -back classes. And so 15 minutes later, I teach a production class, and it, they're just different brains. I mean, one is largely yeah. lecture-based for 75 minutes, two times a week, uh, and, and students are doing projects, but then... I, I literally cross the street and go into another campus building, and, and there we are at, um, you know, doing production. And it's hard. It's it's neat, but it's also kind of fun. That's sort of why I like doing it. You know. Yeah, it keeps you on your toes, doesn't yeah. it? To have yeah. to use those different types of of teaching skills. Well, well here's one of the things I, I always think about you. I, I remember when when you came to Chicago, and you know, you were in a good way, in a way like Orson Welles, uh, it was uh, a gambler, uh, like willing, <laughs> r r you know, willing to take risks, uh, you know, calculated risks with your students and with your classes. And, and I think that, you know, you really like project based stuff. Um, I, yeah, I think, right. and, and you wanted to get them working, but also thinking about the work they were doing. You know, why are we making these decisions and things like this? I remember one of those first classes because I was sort of in there and, and helping or observing or something. It was uh, producing for the corporate client or something like that. One of those classes we were, we were offering back then. And you were like all over it and really wanting to push students, push students in a, in a very, very good way. And and I, I think I would like to think that, that coming to Chicago somehow – you tapped into something that you really like doing, like those type things. Am I, am I wrong about that? Or what, what is, what do you like to do as a teacher? Um, I, I think you, you hit on a lot of things. Uh, definitely the project based things, highly collaborative teaching style. And Chicago was, was such a, so exciting to be in downtown Chicago. And also I think the people I was teaching with, everyone was really trying a lot of yeah. interesting things. Um, and, and not shy about, let, let's try and rethink things. So, you know, we would take students down to, you know, like I, I, I'd take them down to Millennium Park in the first day of a screenwriting course. And we would, we would make up stories about the people walking yeah. by. And then that would dovetail into to, to conversations about things like uh, dramatic conflict and subtext and all of these things that we would go through with throughout the course. But it was a good way to kind of just dive in. Yep. Yeah, no, and, I, I agree yeah. with that. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I, we did all kind. Of, I remember going to the um, uh, oh, what's that the the place that uh, oh, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the center the, that's right up the street. Da the Daily big, Plaza, uh, the, or the yeah, Daily Plaza or the Federal Plaza. Daily Plaza has the Picasso, and Federal Plaza has the. Uh, the uh, Mobius sculpture there, and it's That's it's the a, it's the Mies van der Rohe uh, buildings that are all you know different yes. angles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Inside there, we did something with students where people we, we broke into groups and people were using walkie talkies and we were talking <laughs> about the challenges of coordinating things online and when you have a you know just I mean we just try things like that and some yeah. are more successful than others, but it was fun. Yeah. Well, one of the things you know I I going back to when I taught at Columbia. I mean this is in the late nineties. I, I, I would send students uh, up the street to uh, Federal Plaza to look at those buildings because, the, uh, you know, uh, Mies van der Rohe didn't build them by accident, you know. And if you look at how yeah. the lines in the plaza line up with the pillars and the windows of those buildings, and then one building is is the same building on its side as, as the other one opposite is is vertical, um, it's, it's like not an accident. And uh, that's where I always would say uh, either God is in the details or if you have another point of view, the devil is in the details. But, but uh, you know, seriously, I mean, like getting students out of the classroom, I think is really, really critical. When, when, I, was, when I was in high school, uh, my, my dad uh, was my uh, headmaster of my high school, but he was also uh, my junior and high school physics teacher. And he took us up to the roof of the school building and threw stuff off <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to, to, to prove gravity and, and to say, hey, is this thing going to fall faster than the other thing? And of course, uh, you know, it, the old joke of does a pound of feathers fall faster than a pound of lead? And everyone goes, oh, the lead's heavier. But no, a pound is a pound, of course, and, and they fall at the same rate. But like, guess getting out of the classroom opens people up and it's bringing these real world experiences into into the classroom and and I think that that's that I always like doing that and I I really recognize that in you right off the bat you just liked you know it, you, I think there was something about getting away from the 
lecture, you know, the teacher is God standing in front of the class talking to students, you know, it's make it more interactive. Definitely. And I think if you, uh, uh, if you let it be more interactive, it's more stimulating for you because then they're driving it and they're coming to you with something that you couldn't have anticipated. Yep. And then it keeps you on your toes because yep. you have to go, okay, well, let's see what type of feedback can I give you yep. based on what you want to do? It is, it is one of those great high wire acts, you know, like I, I love those moments where it feels like, you know, you're walking into a, into a classroom unprepared, you know, often you're prepare, <laughs> prepare, prepare, and, but you have to be unprepared sometimes because the students are are giving you things and you have no idea what they're going to say or show or present and you have to be able to respond to it but based on some sort of information that is is valid to them i, I love those moments like i said it's a high you don't know what's going to happen you know and it's like it's like great design because if you get it right they're very motivated and mm -hmm. often it's because it gives them an opportunity to shine in front of their peers they get to show how how they can do really excellent work so it's it's such an interesting thing like if you get it right they come in there they're engaged they're getting enough of an opportunity to kind of you know it's like i used to think you know when you lecture it's like the spotlight is on you but when you teach project stuff it's like you become the spotlight and mm -hmm. you shine it on different people at different times and if you do it in the right way they start to grow under that and and blossom yep. and really amazing things happen i i i agree and and you know I don't know, you know, where I didn't, I, I just sort of took that as a philosophy myself. You did too. We did, you know, I, I was never given any teacher training. I, I don't know how much teacher training you were given, but, but, you know, very like, little. Yeah. I mean, it, it, which is a shame, isn't it? You know, I mean, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm guilty of it. I mean, I know that when, when I've been Dean, I've, I've, I've really insisted on, on working on teacher best pra practices and things like that. But I mean, I really like, that's why I like doing this podcast. I like talking to people about what they do and how they do it, you know? So, so you, you've talked about some things here, but, but, I, you know, I don't make a lot of questions in advance on these things, but, but one of the questions I had for you is what, what are some of the things you like about about teaching and is there any comparison to your entertainment career? Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of comparisons and there's a lot of differences. Uh, maybe if I'll say, I'd say that first, um, I mean, you have this, ex you know, it's, it's often exhilarating. It's, it's, I, I love a job where I'm constantly working on creative projects. Mm -hmm. I come in and it's just, there's people around me doing all kinds of interesting things and, and, um, it's it's can be fun working with young people. I think one of the things that can be a little frustrating uh, is they you know if if things are working they're getting better and better, and by the time they're about ready to graduate they're pretty proficient and mm -hmm. then they go away yep. and then you bring in new people. And whereas if you were working in a production environment you'd have your team and you'd work over time and after three or four or five years you start getting really you know at your best. Yep. So that that the fact that they're always with one foot out the door is can be a little frustrating because there's some great students I'd love to you know continue to work to. with or work yeah I so, say you know if yeah. we could if we could continue to make stuff together yeah. it would just get better and better um, but yeah I think that there there is that excitement of that sort of um, I don't know what's gestalt of when you're working with a group of people and, and it, it sort of lifts up off the ground and becomes something better than yeah. something that any one of you could have done individually. Well, you know, this is this is at least the second time on this podcast we, I've talked about this, about the idea of doing something bigger than yourself or the idea of that the band is greater than the solo artist and th stuff like that. I mean, it's collaborative. You really depend on the other people you are working with. That, that is both on the creative process, but also in the faculty, you know, lounge, you know, you depend on those other people. I mean, you don't know how many times I'd walk down to that fourth floor and sit in your office or, you know, with you and Bacon or Killian or some of those guys and just hang out and chat and like, you know, bounce ideas off each other or hear what you guys were talking about. And that, that feeling I really, really like. Yeah, I think you learn a lot from your peers. I always felt, you know, Killian's so creative as a, as a, I mean, in everything she does, but yeah. as an educator, it always inspired me. I was like, well, I'll push it a little farther because she used to go out on the subways and and improv scenes. Yep. And she'd come back. Yeah, we were just creating moments. Yeah. And I just thought, I love that idea. I mean, if you're a director, that's what you do. That's the essence is you're creating these little moments. And so to take it out into the world, it, it, it sort of heightens it and makes it much more memorable for people. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, so let's, get, let's get up to sort of modern day here. How did you get 
to England. <laughs> I, I remember, you know, nearing the end of your time in Chicago, you your your wife was looking for work, had an opportunity to to go overseas or go to Europe, and and of course you didn't want to be separated like that. But but how did how did you find them or they find you? I mean that's I mean there's a bit of a a, a good risk for for them to take on hiring this. Uh, you know, guy from the States. So how, how'd that all sure. come about? Oh, it was crazy because, um, Chris was getting antsy with her, her position. She was, it was just, uh, she was in, she was working in the corporate world and had this type of job where she's in meetings all day long, sort of drinking from a fire hose, just stressed <laughs> out, looking, looking for some, a change. And uh, at her company, they had a possible position in London, and they they uh, flew her out to interview for it, and it seemed to go well, and she was very excited about it. And she said, would you consider uh, a move to England? And I said, well, let me think about it. Let me see if I can find anything out there. So we were very, you know, at that point, just kind of testing the water. So I just applied at four places. Um but they have a different system, which is kind of interesting. Like you could email the people directly that are hiring and, and you can even have a phone conversation with them, Sweet. which was, yeah, it was very <laughs> nice. And, and I think that helps. And, um, uh, I got two offers Wow. out of the four. So I was like, okay, now this is interesting. And, and in the meantime, her, the job that she was applying for had been put on hold. They said, we're not going to uh, hire for this position right now. So then we had this sort of tricky decision to make. She wasn't happy where she was, wanted to move. I had an opportunity. We didn't know if she would or not. And we just thought about it and decided to take the risk. So I moved out and I wound up being uh, in uh, here for nine months uh, before Chris and, and our daughter Maya uh, joined us. And then we actually persuaded our son Jack, who was older and had moved out of the house, to come out here to school. I mentioned him going to Ravensbourne recently. Mm -hmm. He's now in uh, NFTS in a master's program. Wow, there. good for him. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, huh. So, so, and and you know, what what did what did they see in you at Bournemouth that that you know attracted you to them? I mean, or you know, them to you rather. I'm sorry. What uh, you know? What I mean, you know. Yes, you had the Hollywood experience. You were doing this, but what were they? What were they looking for? Well, it was a really interesting position. Um, there was actually two that I applied for, and they were, uh, and the one that was in some ways more of a stretch for me because it was in the journalism uh, department was the one that I was more intrigued by because the, the the title um, is uh, Senior Lecturer in Digital Storytelling. Oh. And I, I just I thought that sounded really interesting sure. and it would dovetail with a lot of the, you know, at Tribeca, we've been doing all these really interesting new media related projects. Mm -hmm. And I thought and they were looking for somebody who had more of a sense of narrative and more of a, uh, so I, I, you know, I, I, I told them right up front, I said, I, I, my background isn't in hard news journalism. You know, I worked in production for 20 years. And I've certainly interviewed people and and done a lot of journalistic things, but I'm I'm not the guy who who you know came up in a in a newsroom. Yeah. Um, and they said, well, well, they were looking for something different, somebody that did more script writing, somebody who'd done a lot of stuff with new media, and so it, it was actually a really good fit. Hmm. So you know, I just I think that was that was uh, part of the appeal for me and for them. Wow. And the idea of a brand new title that nobody had ever done before and something that's kind of amorphous. It's like, what does it mean? What's digital storytelling? Yeah. So it, it was an opportunity to kind of define what that role was, that's which great. I loved. And of course. It's allowed me to work across departments. So, you know, I work with the animation department and I work with uh, the production people, the journalists. So it's it's fun. That's exciting. So so what uh, is, is it tenure? Is it tenure track or do they I don't even do they have tenure there? What, what's I, what's the system, you know? Yeah, they don't have a tenure system, um, but yeah, I'm I'm a uh, you know you, they have more levels, which is interesting. They have more so levels. Sort of more, yeah, more hoops to jump through uh. in a sense. You know, there's uh, 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 I, I don't even know all of them. You know, but there's you know there's lectures and senior lectures yeah, sure. and yeah. and readers and you know it just goes on and on. Yeah. But um, but you know you're not one thing is you're not a professor right away. That's the the uh, the goal to get to. Whereas in the States, you know, if you're an assistant, if you're uh tenure track, yeah. uh, you know, you're assistant professor already. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and then tenured, you're, yeah, you're, mo you're moving and moving your way up the, the ladder there. Yeah. What, so what, uh, what do your students think of the American, 
You know, do they do, are they do they have questions about the U.S.? What do they think about the the American in the room? I, I think they're pretty open to it for the most part. Um, I, uh, I it's funny sometimes I'll have people go they'll you know because people can be self deprecating about where they come from. They're like, well, why did you come here? You know, you were living <laughs> in Los Angeles. Why would you want to be here, this sleepy little town? Uh, but it's it, you know I think they because they're so used to it. That you know, to me, it's still. I feel like I'm in a fairy tale when I walk around, and there's castles and <laughs> uh, you know things. Every I live in Winchester, you know, by we're not far from the cathedral, and it's this ancient city. Used to be the the you know the capital of Wessex. Uh, you know, it's the statue of Alfred the Great. I mean, that stuff. I I'm still just fascinated yeah. by all that. That that's um, great. Yeah, but but. Uh, yeah, I think I, 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 in a way, I think that's good. I remember my first semester there, I was teaching a, a an assignment that was about these little seven minute documentaries they were making, and I was saying to one team, you know, you guys should get out in the countryside. It's so beautiful, and it was like they were seeing it through my eyes mm-hmm. and realizing, yeah, I guess it is kind of beautiful. <laughs> you know, maybe we should go out to the new forest and shoot some stuff. And and they did and came up with some nice images. Well, I, I think that there's that great thing of the outsider comes in with a new perspective that then shows all the, the locals, hey, this is what's in your backyard. I mean, over history, I mean, Alexis de Tocqueville did it coming to this country, writing like a Definitely. definitive history about the United States. Charles Dickens did it, you know, with Bleak House when he came here and other things about it, it, sometimes it takes someone, a foreigner, a traveler to come to the town and say, hey, this is what you all have right here. Don't you know it? And I, I think I can certainly see your students responding to you uh, about that. So I want to talk bef- before we go here, I want to talk about some of your personal sure. work. I mean, you, you have made, in my opinion, opinion and probably in your opinion too you, you've made a significant change from talk soup you know and and those <laughs> those fun kind of you know cable tv shows that are on in the united states i mean you you did desolation angels which was uh, uh performed or read by steppenwolf and now you're working on the mary shelley stuff talk to me uh, talk to us about your your personal work and what are some of your goals there and what what do you see yourself doing sure um yeah, like you say, back in the day, I was doing more sort of sketch comedy and sort of some more sort of just kind of fun, uh, sort of silly uh, uh, things like that. But uh, although I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, but yeah, doing, um, uh, you know, the Desolation Angels uh, is a, a, a dramatic piece. Actually, we have a stage reading of it that we're doing in Bournemouth in April, which will mm. be nice. Um, so I'm still kind of working on that. I like doing theatrical stuff. It was kind of a nice, um, something about theater is just, you get to right to the essence of what a story is. Um, and, uh, the, uh, the Mary Shelley one you mentioned is called Shelley's heart is my, the new project that I've really been working on. It's nice because one of the things that, um, uh, you can, uh, it's being supported increasingly, especially in the UK, and I think it really comes out of Australia, is this idea of practice-based uh, research or practice as research. Um, so, it, you know, it, traditionally the idea was if you want to be taken seriously as a researcher, you don't make things, but you analyze things that other people have made. Yeah. Um, now uh, there is a push for this idea of recognition of that the actual – artifact that you've created can represent a legitimate research output. Uh, it's, it helps if you, uh, put together at least some sort of reflection on the process and can do things like identify, you know, why it's, it's a form of new knowledge, something new in the field. So in, in terms of Shelley's heart, this is something that I'm doing. It's not just my own personal project. It's actually, uh, part of my research, nice. uh, as yeah, part of my scholarship. So, what what's happening is there's uh, this year 2018 is the 200th anniversary of uh, Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein, mm-hmm. and uh, in Bournemouth where I teach in Bournemouth Town Center there's a church called St Peter's Church and and there is the Shelley family tomb and Mary Shelley's buried there, along with the heart of her husband Percy <sighs> Shelley. Wow, which I always thought was kind of creepy and fascinating and I wanted to know more about it. Uh, and she's also her parents are there. Mary Godwin, who was like the first feminist. Mm-hmm. William William Godwin, who was a 
you know, really interesting radical philosopher of his day. So all of these people, there's this rich history. And of course, they were hanging out with Lord Byron and John Keats. And so, so I, about two years ago, I started cooking up this idea for a, a location, locative story or location aware story, because I'd, I'd heard about these things. And basically what that is, is a, pl a story where you go to a physical place and as you walk around through the environment, little bits of narrative can be unlocked. So you're huh. you're looking on your phone and you're looking at what looks like a little sat nav uh, map of the environment and it indicates a place and you walk over to that place and you get close enough, you can unlock another piece of the story. And That's so the cool. way these, have, yeah, it's, 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 it's a new way of sort yeah. of, enjoy, of, of in, in, you know, embedding the environment with some, some narrative. Yeah. There are a lot of geolocated, you know, apps and things like that, which have some, some stories, you know, you can have a treasure chest, uh, find a, a, you know, a thing like that. But this, I like the story element, especially in the historical realm as you're talking about. Yeah. And so I started thinking this would be an interesting educational tool. Teachers could take their students here on field trips and they could explore the churchyard and follow this narrative that would also unlock facts about the real historical characters. So basically that's what I wrote up and I sort of made modern versions of Mary Shelley and the romantic poets, modern alter egos of them. And they're, uh, I put it together, uh, and showed it to a, uh, a colleague of mine who actually runs a local theater company. He said, well, you could do this as a play first of all, and that'd help you get actors together. Uh, so we did it as a staged reading a year ago in Bournemouth, and that went well. And based on that, we were able to get an actual stage debut, which was just last November. And we put it on the stage at the Shelley Theater, which wow. is <laughs> actually was used to be Shelley Manor. It was created by Mary Shelley's son. Wow. So, so um, that was exciting to do. And it was a multimedia thing. And so we shot a lot of stuff in the churchyard including somebody as a monster walking around in the churchyard, this actor, Steve Rollins, who did a great job. And so uh, with all those elements now, uh, I'm taking it the next step, which is to, to really flesh out and finish this location thing. We'll debut it in October. And there'll basically be four different paths based on the four different characters. So wow. you can follow Byron, who's based on Lord Byron, and he goes around to you know, that path follows around 13 places in the churchyard, or John, or Mary, or Percy's ghost. Wow. So, Wait, so do you have someone doing programming for it? I mean, on the back end? I mean, because it's uh, someone's got to, you know, make some decisions on, oh, am I following this person or that person? How are you doing the technology? Yes, I got very lucky in that regard. There's um, one of my colleagues, Charlie Hargood, uh, just started last spring. He came over from uh, University of Southampton. And he's created a web-based platform called Story Places, something that you can definitely worth checking out. Uh, they've already done a, a series of these. It's fairly new. It's open source. Um, they did one, for instance, last summer in Crystal Palace Park. And, the, and, and normally what they do is they'll have, uh, you know, a few different uh, – they'll have like one main writer and then maybe some students will write some additional narratives around these things. But so far, they've been fairly modest in terms of their production. So if you if you go to that, you can you can experience it in demo mode. So if you wow. went to Story Places, you could go to the Crystal Palace one, and you could put in demo mode and navigate around and unlock little bits of story. But what you'll see are basic. It's text based with a few photographs, and the text tends to be either uh, you know just one narrator, narrator you know first mm -hmm. person often. So it's not scenes with characters interacting with each other. Whereas I think what, what'll be nice about this is it has interactive elements, it's got animations, yeah. it's got actual characters, you're embroiled in a dramatic situation. Is, is it, will it be on a phone or would it be, how, how do yes. we see it? <laughs> it's on your phone. Uh -huh. So uh, people will go to the churchyard and, and uh, walk around with their phones on at the Story Places uh, cool. site and move from place to place and unlock little bits of it. Wow. Well, I, as I as you and I were trading emails, I, I will hook you up with my friend Charlotte Gordon, who uh, wrote the book about Mary Shelley and her mother, and uh, and will be very, very interested in this, I, I'm sure. So this sounds terrific, man. And and you can't get farther away from Talk Soup 
<laughs> than, than, the, than the author of Frankenstein, you know. Even though well, I, that's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'd, lo- I'd love to meet Charlotte. That, that Her book, uh, Romantic Outlaws, was re- incredibly influential, actually, on this. And there's a... There's a, there's some scenes actually that I write between this modern alter ego of Mary Shelley and Mary Wollstonecraft, who becomes a character in, in that story path, really influenced by that. It's a, you know, there's fictional dramatic scenes, but just based on some of the stuff that Charlotte was noticing about that dynamic between these two people that never really knew each other, because yeah. Mary Wollstonecraft died after giving birth to Mary Shelley. Yeah, and, and just yet, in that horrible way. Ugh. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> and and then their lives are are very interesting echoes of yeah. one another, and yeah. and and so yeah, that book was she she structured it so it goes chapter to chapter between the two lives, and you get to see it sort of brings out all the parallels between them. An yeah. Interesting approach. Well, I, I'll hook you up with her, but but Brad, this, this has really been great, and I'm really really happy for you. I, I you know this is you know you're a guy who is I think innovative, and and just hearing you talk about this project just, you know, reinforces that. And it's one of the reasons I wanted you to come to Chicago and teach with us. And um, and I'm so glad to hear you doing so well and, and your family's doing well. And I mean, you ever come back to the States? Uh, we were back in, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much. What a nice thing to say. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah uh, we were we were back in uh, just over the holidays back in Phoenix uh, and visiting my, my, my folks and they're they're doing well, and it was just great to go back and reconnect and see everybody. And, and were you were you impacted? I mean, I know uh, Great Britain and Ireland had uh, a serious winter storm last week. Uh, were you impacted by that at all? Or you? Yeah, down we had south snow. Enough? Wow! For the first time, I was like, "This is like almost proper Chicago snow, but not quite." <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 give my best to your family and, and Brad, really great. I, thank you so much for doing this and and, uh, and and good luck to you in the play. And, and you know, I'll, when this goes up, I'll, I'll, I'll do a web, you know, on the website, I will put up all your links and all that information. And then when it goes uh, for real in October, you said, uh, we'll circle back and maybe get you back on here for a shorty. Okay, fantastic. It was great talking to you, Peter. All right, Brad. Thanks. Take care. So that's it. That's my talk with Brad Giori. Brad, thank you for joining me from Bournemouth, England, uh, via Skype. So if you heard a pop or a, a, a crackle, uh, it is Skype and the internet. But Brad, thank you so much. Uh, great to see you. Uh, and uh, when this goes up, we'll have all the links to Brad's stuff. Uh, and uh, in October, we'll get him back here when his uh, project goes live. And uh, also, maybe I'll get Charlotte Gordon on here if uh, I can convince her to, to do it. Um, Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks for joining us yet again, and it's time for me to get a drink. Mm